welcome to Ed Lucitsi Leadership Summit um, Series 8 featuring um, Sensible Soccer today. My name is Jasmine and I am your MC for today. I'm sorry that I was a bit far away because I think I was excited. I was reading all of the comments from the participants and I'm telling you, we have been receiving participants from all over the countries in the world. We are receiving participants from Oman, to Egypt, India, up to United Kingdom. Thank you very much for joining us. So my name is Yasmin and I am your MC for today. Again, welcome back to Edu City Leadership Summit at Leeds 2021. And we would like to first thank uh, the Ministry of Higher Education for their support and all of our partners. We have Lenovo, Crest, Swinbeat, DGX Global, Maybank, TikTok, and of course our international partner, Sensible Soccer and GV8. And do you know that we are now streaming live on TikTok? Check out our EduCity official account to view this particular series. Before I start, just a quick summary of the previous session. So it was presented by both Mike and David talking about topic communication. Some of the key takeaways that we can um, sort of digest and still uh, take in terms of tips and guidance is um, first thing in terms of rule in communication is to listen. And then communication is key in delivering message where timing, style, tones are taken into consideration. But most importantly, be brave to make mistakes when communicating so we can reflect and learn from that mistakes. Today's topic happens to be the last session featuring, of course, uh, Mike Field, Chairman and Director of Sensible Soccer and also Assistant Manager to Manchester United. David Horrocks, Director of Sensible Soccer. But fret not, ladies and gentlemen, we do have two more coming up before the end of Ed Leeds 2021. Today's session will be moderated by Cecilia Pereira Yates, who happens to be the Managing Director of GB8. And they will be talking today on the topic of leadership, where the speakers will provide their own experience in recognizing leadership and the various leadership traits. We will also be announcing how you will win Sensible Soccer merchandise, but you will need to wait until the end of the session. So um, let us look at this video, giving sort of like a teaser to um, the topic today, and of course, another introduction, uh, intro another introduction to the panelists. Hi, everybody. Firstly, welcome to this webinar series. I know that there are some of you who um, haven't joined us before, so this is your first session with us. Um, this is actually our last session with, with Mike and, and David. Before we start, I thought I'll just give you a, a quick introduction. So my name is Cecilia and I am the Managing Director of GB8 um, and I'm based in the UK. I'm from Malaysia, so uh, Selamat Petang everybody. Um, in the UK now, it's in the morning. So good morning and from wherever in the world you are, hello and welcome. I'm honoured to be working with Edgy City Iskanda, Asia's first multi-campus education city in their first international webinar series. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Edgy City, it is situated in the state Johor and is a unique setup that houses 14 education institutions and training academies, both local and international. Some of the foreign branch campuses here in Edgy City are University of Southampton, Malaysia, the University of Reading, Malaysia, and Newcastle University of Medicine, Malaysia. Now that's three out of the five UK universities um, in Malaysia. So for today, please feel free to um, ask your questions during the session. Um, put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, and we will try and answer as many uh, questions as we can. So 
Over the last three sessions with Mike and David, we explored the themes of growth mindset, decision making, uh, and communications. And today we'll explore leadership. So to start, perhaps I can ask David. David, to start today's session, would you be able to summarize on the three topics we discussed earlier on? And, and why did we choose the topics for this Future Leaders Seminar? Yes, certainly. Uh, and good morning, afternoon, good day to everybody out there. Uh, the four topics that we chose, as you mentioned, growth mindset, decision making, communication and leadership. And the reason that these have been picked is they are what we would call personal uh, soft skills that we can use as human beings, whether that be in a capacity as a student, uh, as a member of the workforce, as a manager or as a leader that will help you in terms of interacting with other human beings to be able to be the best that you can possibly be, for want of a better word, uh, and, and help that human interaction work towards group thinking, group working, working in teams and operating towards any goals or objectives that you may have. Uh, we, we do live in an evolutionary and a developmental world where things are always moving, they're changing, and we're always looking to achieve or go somewhere. And the greater understanding I think that you have of these topics, and perhaps more importantly, the greater application that you have of them, the more you will grow along your journey, gain greater experience, and hopefully in turn be more successful as you pass through life. Thank you, David. So um, leadership is a vast topic and has been widely written um, by some, some very good leaders. Um, you know, Steve Jobs wrote the book on, on um, leadership and so did Phil Knight, for example, from Nike. One of the best-selling books on leadership is by Sir Alex Ferguson. So Mike, you're currently in your second spell at Manu uh, with Ole now. Can you give us an insight into your experience having played for and worked with um, Sir Alex Ferguson? Yeah, it was a very uh, interesting time, both playing and, and sort of being his assistant as well. It's, it's two two different roles really uh, over a, a long period of time but in that time you understand the development of everything and the development of him and the development of him making me better so yeah. my experiences with him was he was at times a very hard manager very direct very astute very knowledgeable about the game with his experiences within the game but he was also quite a soft manager at times as well you know, his leadership skills were probably different to everybody he worked with, yet that became um, really something special. He, he could treat people differently, but he could get the best out of everybody. And he gave you the opportunity to be a better person, to be a better leader in yourself. I mean, I, I do believe we're all we're all leaders in our own little way. You know, we all lead ourselves, for instance. You know, we all uh, lead our minds in the direction we want to go in. But Sir Alex was very good at giving you the opportunity to grow, to really make decisions, to really push the boundaries. And he, for me, when I became his assistant, he, he allowed me to make decisions. And he mm. backed up decisions. As long as he knew about, the, the, you know, what I was thinking, what I was proposing, he would give me advice along the way, but he would always back the decision that I that I came to. And I, I thought that was really good because that made me grow and it gave me responsibility. But he was uh, he was terrific in his leadership skills. He had soft skills and hard skills when needed. And initially when I was a player, they were very hard and very different because you know he instilled that winning mentality in you to be part of a team and to win football matches. When I became a coach and a manager. He wanted me to lead the team and lead players through my experiences, you know, and I think that was a massive, massive help that I'd played under him 
And really, I was a reflection of him to some degree, but also I was different from him. You know, my leadership skills were different and it worked or it seemed to work anyway. And uh, he never thanked me for it, but he, uh, he, he was always there to offer help and advice and, and, and direct. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mike. Um, very quickly, we've had our first question and I, and I want to delve into that really because it's a, it's a really good question from Kavita. So Kavita says, good afternoon, Mr. David and Mr. Mike. Um, I would like to ask on a recent quote I read from Robin Sharma, to lead is to serve. Leaders who value contribution above self-glorification. I would like to hear your thoughts on this quote. A little advice maybe on becoming a leader with a heart. That's a wonderful question, Kavita. Perhaps David, you want to start and then Mike, you could yeah. follow? Yeah, uh, certainly. Um, I mean, let's go academically for, first. Uh, there are lots of theories of leadership out there, depending on sort of which avenue you take. Some people say six, some say five, some say seven, some say eight. Uh, and with regard to the particular question, one of those theories is participative theory. Uh, and you've got behavioral theory which can both be linked to the group, really, uh, and that sort of behaviour or interaction, if you will, amongst the group. So this is where the leader, it may be a leader, for instance, in charge of a football team or organisation that might have 36 players and anything from 15 to 20 staff. You're actually facilitating those people to work things out or for those people to make decisions, those people to come up with solutions. So you're perhaps setting scenarios or, or giving evidence of situations that they are going to go into and perhaps asking the question, work amongst yourselves and how do you think we should go about this? And the leader will always have an idea and they'll have a solution, that's without doubt. But if that solution has got A, B, C, D, E and F, you ask that question and you put it to your group, put it to your people and get that interaction, they will probably feed back to you that it's got A, B, C and F. So they're about 60, 70% there anyway. And what you're then putting is that responsibility and ownership onto the group. And the likelihood of them carrying this out because it's their design and their ownership is far higher but also the likelihood of them actually enjoying what they're doing and really having a passion for being a, a, a part of this action that's going to take you from A to B, again, is far higher because they feel proud, they feel responsible, they feel engaged, they feel part of the process. They actually feel like it's them that's yeah. leading. And I think good leaders make their people lead to get from A to B. That's brilliant. David, Mike, have you got something to share on that? Yeah, I can agree with with all those all those points Dave made. But the question is, has always been for me, what is a what is a leader? You know, because you're a leader, does that mean that everybody's following you, sort of thing? And I, I don't truly believe in that. You know, I don't truly believe that everybody follows the leader. I think the leader sets examples for sure. Mm. I think he sets the boundaries possibly at, at certain times. But I think a leader gives, a good leader in my eyes, gives ownership to people. He helps create a team around himself to be able to, to lead from the front because you are, as a leader, probably more of the spokesman. You are more of the voice. You know, and particularly in my sport, the leader usually is the manager or the CEO and, and, and what are their common goals. So that message has to be put out there quite common. But I think from my point of view, I see myself in leadership is to offer my help and advice and offer myself to other people to grow. I like to see growth. I like to see people have a good understanding of what their role is. I, I like to see people express their views. I like to listen to that and I like to direct. You know, it's, I, I like to see that direction coming from everywhere. And I don't see myself as a leader, as the guy at the, at the pinnacle, at the top. Yeah. I, yeah. I see it as a collaboration, really. And, and, and I'm still 
trying to lead from the front, yes, but I need people to push me through that, through that phase and into that leadership and, and to have the, the group, the group itself feel comfortable that I can make things happen for them. Yeah. I can give them that promise. I can give them that help. And for me, it's all about, you know, not using people, but advising people and bringing them along, bringing them along for the journey. And uh, if you can get more of those people on board, then I think you can push for success. Yeah, that's a brilliant answer, Mike. And I think that really shows that part of being a, a leader and leading with the heart is, is actually being able to empower the people you work with. Yeah, um, I think you have to be on that, that sort of, to a degree, that level footing. You are part of the, 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 the mechanics of where you want to go. Yeah. You know, it just, it just may be that I am the face of that direction, you yeah. know, that you want to go in. And, and I think it's really important. But I also think you have to you have to understand that you haven't got there on your own. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. there are a lot of things, you know, in that mechanism that take you to where you want to be. And, uh, and I think you should share that and enjoy yeah. that. That's brilliant. I've got another question here from Sabri. Uh, and Sabri says, I'm a doctorate student from the University of Wales. And his question to both of you, Mike and David, what are your motivation words in setting up high standard? So maybe David, you could start with that one. Um, motivation for me is what's expected of me. Uh, what, what do people want? Whether that is who I'm working for, who I'm working with, or in terms of who I'm leading, what do they want and what do they expect from me? I always try to treat people how I would expect to be treated myself. And I think that's always a good basis to get a good relationship and a good interaction between the two. And personally, I, I have a motivation to be better every day. Uh, sometimes I'm being led and sometimes I'm being a leader. But going back to the, the whole essence of Ed Leeds, which is the growth mindset, we're all growing every single day. Um, the most successful leaders in the world will be surpassed or overtaken by someone else and they might then want to get back above them and that's one of the healthy things of the human race really we we do push each other and we see that as a positive and as a and, a, and as a test really so you know again some people might actually look at that failure if someone passes you but it, for me no it's motivation everything that's out there is a stimulus to you and it's how you choose to use that in terms of improving what you do. So see things as a challenge, see things as a test. Don't put too much pressure on yourself, but have that growth mindset and be, be open. And that will motivate you to move forward. Yeah. Thank you, David. Mike? Yeah, motivation is a, is a big thing. You know, why do we wake up in the morning? you know and, and why do we go to sleep at night we go to sleep to recover ready to do it all again so you know we yeah. i wake up in the morning looking forward to the day i don't really tend to look back if if possible um i look i only look back when i want to be constructive or i want to not make the mistakes i made previously but but in the main i look forward to the day and the challenges the challenges ahead you know my challenge now at this moment in time is probably going into into the training ground this morning and, and feeling the mood the mood of the place after a great win during the week but then that mood may be different it may be different to what I'm expecting I'm hoping it will be great it will be happy it will be you know it will be productive but there may be something that just lands on my desk first thing that morning which really challenges me yeah really challenges me to get the environment right again but yeah. for me it, it is a challenge but it's also being part of a team. It's teamwork. I look forward to the teamwork. I look forward to how everybody's going to react during yeah. the day, how everybody's going to put the jigsaw puzzles together to make it a, a good day, to make it a really productive day. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, it's really important to, to be open-minded as well, be mm -hmm. open-minded as to what the day can bring. Yeah. Because believe you me, there's troubles out there. If you want to go looking for trouble, you can find it. <laughs> but if you go in with an open mind 
then I think you can um, you can really be productive in, in just one day's work. Yeah, that's great. Nashan has asked uh, two questions, but I'll, I'll take the, the second question that he's asked. Um, he's actually asked, how do, you, how do you make yourself an example for your team as a leader? Um, and, and especially if there is some difference of opinion between yourself as a leader and the people in your team. Mike, maybe you could... Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very good question. Um, I think what you try to be is yourself. You are yourself. So what I mean by that is don't try to be somebody you are not. And I, because I think if, if, if you are and you try to be somebody that you are not, I think you, you then have a problem. You have a problem convincing other people to join in your thought process. So yeah. for me, you know, mm. I am what I am. I'm pretty open-minded. I'm pretty relaxed most of the time. Um, and I try to find a way through issues that may arise. But I try to translate that to people that, you know, there are a lot of hours in a day. There's a lot of things to do. And what may seem to be a problem may not be a problem, you know, further down the line because you've discussed it, you've found out more information, you've analysed it, you've passed it on to other people. So that problem is then shared. And before you know it, you forget about what the problem was. You can't even remember it. So, so for me, it's, uh, it is a challenge, but I think it's being yourself. But because I think people can see through who you are not. So just be yourself and, uh, and get that message out there. And if there is conflict, which there always will be at some point, then you do learn those skills. You do find a way through it to agree to disagree sometimes, but, but that, that's just life. Yeah. Yes. Um, Salah Houdin has asked something quite similar, um, but mainly, how does a leader, um, how do you become a good leader with clear vision um, and someone who can always encourage your staff and not someone who blames staff when there's a problem? Um, David, maybe you can share on that one. Uh, I think you can be part of the process to a degree, uh, you, you can involve yourself in that, uh, particular, whether it's task or objective or direction that they're going in. And a bit like Mike just said there, be yourself. So you're actually, you're showing your own emotional side. You're showing empathy for the people that may have to achieve something or uh, surmount a particular task. And then when you get involved, they will see you as a person. Uh, as opposed to a leader. A leader can be quite a big and daunting label at times, and the very word sometimes puts you on a pedestal up above those people who may look up to you but also fear you at the same time. Yeah. So I think it is important to have a degree of involvement in the process. And with the empathy, you kind of, how do they feel? What's difficult? What's successful? And, and perhaps the things that are successful, encourage them to do more of that. If things are difficult, then open it up and ask questions uh, with them and with the group and with yourself. And also I'm sure the humility that yeah, I'm trying to work this out as well with you. I'm actually trying to facilitate us towards getting an answer here rather than I know the answer and it's up to you to work it out. And, you know, leadership is... It is the movement of groups or collectives. Ultimately, you, you, you are trying to get somewhere as a collective. And I think it's important that that is the key theme rather than it's me and you. And yeah. the, more, the more that you can do that, there is far greater strength in communities and in groups. Yeah, and I think, I think you know, leadership, as you say, in, in groups, I mean, if we look at football in itself, Mike, on, on the fields, there's, there's, there's all of them there from the players to the technical staff. Now, yeah. how, how does leadership take place in that environment? What does it look like? I think just, just on that point of, of, of blame and what have you, I think, I think it's quite natural to look for blame in, in, at certain times because we now have this environment of departments, departmentalization and 
one department's involved in one thing, you're involved in another. And, and when things don't quite work out the way you want, everybody looks to a department to try and find an excuse or, or whatever. And I think from a leadership point of view, it's important that that person who sits there looking across all those departments really understands what they're trying to do, what they're trying to achieve and pull it all together mm. and pull it all together. And, and, and yes, I think there is an element of, of fault and blame, but it's making sure that it's consistent, you're consistent with all departments as to what the outcome needs to be. You know, that's, that's just the answer on that. On the other side of things, when it comes to on the field and things like that, I think what a leader does, and if you want to class a leader as a captain or, or the manager or even the coaches, I think from a leader's point of view, whoever's in charge puts the onus on the people to be self-leaders. You know, Certainly on a football field, the more captains you can have who are all pulling in the same direction, then the more chance you have of good decisions being made on the football field. And the football field is an area where split decisions are made. It's incredible how fast decisions are made. Sometimes it yeah. falls the plan. Sometimes it's chaotic. And that yeah. is in business world as well. You know, that's in, yeah. in a student's life, it's chaotic. You know, yeah. or seems to be chaotic. So I think through leadership, you sort of are looking for people who can self-motivate, can make decisions quickly can pull people together on a football field at certain times. They're not working in silos. They're not on their own. They're all experiencing the same problem, you know, and, yeah. and then it's, it's a case of how quickly can they resolve them problems and, and get back to the basics. And I, and I do think a leader does apply some basic elements, you know, and, and sometimes we all look for the secret of leadership. We look for the secret of why that happens. And believe you me, sometimes on a football field, it just happens <laughs> and you react to that moment. And yeah. that's what leadership is all about. Can you get that message across quickly, effectively? Yeah. Can you communicate it well? And can they take it on board? Can they own it and do it? Mm. You know? And, yeah. uh, and I think it's, you know, it is chaotic at times. Leadership is chaotic. It's not smooth running. It isn't, believe you me. Yeah. But, but I think a shared responsibility is, is very good, particularly on, on a football field. Yeah. Now, I think I'm just I, I, can, but I can elaborate on that because a lot of the viewers yeah. uh, and participants may well have seen this. You, you go to the topic of Manchester United. They won the football match 9-0 the other mm. night. Yes. Now... That was a team effort and a collective effort. There were seven different goal scorers and you found a situation where the opponent had a player sent off very early in the game. Mm. So it could quite possibly have been easy for the team to relax and just sort of think, well, it's going to happen. But not only did you get seven different goal scorers, the first goal was scored by a defender and he led by his actions in terms of continuing in his job and his role and actually getting into the box to score the goal. Uh, and the goal scored by defenders, midfielders and forwards and substitutes right across the whole team over a, a 90 plus minute period. So I think here you actually had a live example of each one of those 11 players that was on that pitch at the particular time, leading themselves, leading the unit and leading the interaction amongst the collective so, and that's how you end up with such a result which can be a difficult situation playing against 10 men because the majority of the game is going to be in the opponent's half and it can be difficult to break them down so yeah. I, do, I do think there was a great picture there for everyone to see yeah just picking up on that David can I just ask Mike now David you mentioned you know nine goals were scored that day um, and, and it was by seven different people. Now, in that team, Mike, and this, this might relate in a, in a work situation as well, you might be quite a junior person in that team, but you also want to become a leader within your own right. What do you think are the, are the skills that that person needs? You know, especially if you are junior in ranking in that environment to actually step up because you've got it within you 
but how do you what what, what else do you need to I, yeah i think i think if we're looking at the junior aspect of it or yeah certainly the junior aspect then i think a lot of it is observation observe what is going on observe the people around you and see if that fits into your mindset see if that's you know i i often looked for uh, you know or tried to answer the question why me why yeah. me why was i chosen you know why yeah. was i the one that got the 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 thumbs up from sir alex to go from playing to coaching to then managing why me he never answered that question but all mm. i could think about was i must have understood the mechanisms to get me to where i wanted to go and then i introduced myself into that system and add, added something to it maybe that was my personality my my experiences in a way i often think because i played at the club for five years five seasons because i achieved something at the club as a player because i had issues at the club when i was a player i wasn't the favorite player you know, I wasn't, I wasn't the world's worst, but I wasn't the, the world's best neither. But I fit into that group to be successful. And then I think when you are working through those ranks, you take little bits of everything you see, everything you observe, and then you apply them as and when you possibly can get your message across. And that may not be getting your message across to the leader. It may be to people within that leadership group that take it further. So you you use people along the way to, to to you know the power the power of of suggestion and the power of being yourself and the power of listening is huge and people can pass that on they can pass that on to the right people an idea a thought a voice they can then say oh you know had a great conversation with so and so earlier on and they made a good point so they're passing it up the line. And, and then yeah. it eventually gets to where it needs to get. And then all of a sudden, you may be looked upon as an interesting person, interesting enough to talk to the relevant people that can move you forward. You know, and it's, yeah. you know, there's, there's a bit of luck in there. There's a bit of chance in there. But if you know, if you know that what you're offering is important to you and you can get that message across to people around you and above you, then I think people would be foolish not to take that on board. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Um, I think that sort of answers the question that Mahadev from JB had asked, just, you know, um, how does team sport influence workplace leadership skills? And I think we've kind of answered those questions, uh, that particular question. Now, Mohammed Saifuddin has asked a question, um, which is very uh, relevant for this time that we're in. He says, I would like to ask, your opinion on the biggest challenge in leadership nowadays, especially during this pandemic time. So David, what do you, what do you think is the biggest challenge during this pandemic? Uh, the first thing that the pandemic has taken away from us is physical human interaction. Uh, so we can't actually physically be in a place yeah. with groups. So, I think the first thing is always understanding that, understanding what that is and understanding that that is a fact uh, and that we, right now, there is nothing that we can do about that. So the fact that you understand it and you've kind of parked it, if you will, and put it to one side and this is out of my control, there's nothing I can personally do about it and that is the way the situation is. So then you're clear. I think after that, you then look at, so therefore what are the opportunities and the opportunities in the pandemic for the majority of people firstly you have more time because a lot of the travel has been taken out of people's days and the average person commutes around about 45 minutes to work so that's an hour and a half a day uh, over a five day week you've gained around about seven and a half hours there so if everyone was to be given seven and a half hours what would I do with that? Would, can I improve my health? Is that 30 minutes perhaps going for a walk or doing some exercise? Can I read a book? Can I listen to a podcast? Now, the other thing that I particular, particularly have found in a normal working day where we're traveling around, uh, in some of my roles, I have to conduct and be in a lot of meetings. 
physically it's difficult to be in more than two, three meetings a day. Okay. Now, in the world of Zoom and online, I've found certain days where I can do eight, 10 meetings. So you can get more, but yeah. then at the same time, you've got to be careful with it. Don't set them all for an hour. Why am I meeting this person? How long does it need to be? Sometimes it's 15, sometimes 30, sometimes 45. Uh, but also, I think you can manage your time better as well, because there isn't that knock on the door, can you just do this? Or so not in that department, can you take over from me? So you can switch off and say, well, I have no meetings between two and four o'clock and I'm not putting any in. So I'm going to act on the meetings that I had yesterday. So you've got more time. You've got a better opportunity to organise your own personal structure in your own day. And I think you've got to look at the, be it daily or be it, be it weekly, what is required? What do I want at the end of this? And you've also got time to actually sit down and evaluate it, whereas Sometimes it might be the end of the week and that's then a drive home that's relief or it's a bus or it's a train journey. So there are positives in the pandemic that you can take from this and utilise that as a, as a real opportunity for self-development so that when we do go back, it's a better you that goes back. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, are you... Yeah, we found, well, personally, I've found it refreshing you know, to get off that, that treadmill sometimes of 24-7, thinking about others, thinking about where the next day is going to take you and, and planning. We still have to do those yeah. things, but I think you can breathe a little bit more now. You know, obviously, we, we want to make sure that we're fit and healthy and that we're doing the right things and, and, and finding time for ourselves, really. And I think it has given us time for ourselves. But I, yeah. from a football point of view and an environment... I think it's been worked really, really well. I mean, we are fortunate in football that we are continuing to do our daily jobs. We're still living our, our daily lives. What it has done, it has mentally focused you on what's important and what's not. Because mm -hmm. in a normal yeah. day, in a normal uh, working day or part of your life has always been frantic like I say it can be chaotic it can be uh, it, it has ups and downs during that day but I think now through Covid because you step back a little bit mm. you have actually influenced yourself to say do I really need to do that today yeah. do I really that can wait a little bit longer mm. yes we're playing games every three days but but I found it really a breath of fresh air to be able to say no that's that's not important anymore what is important is tightening up things because they become smaller your environments become smaller mm. you know we have a huge training facility but we have you know we hear about this word you're in your own bubble or this term you know we've created our own specific environment which works for us and we found it a refreshing change that the players have become far more focused on what is important and we all we all live in at this moment in time with a, a small amount of people. You know, I, we see the players more often, I see the players and the staff more often than probably I do um, my wife and kids. Yeah. Because that is the role, but but it's it's all done now in a, in a way whereby I've got a, a real good balance. I can mm. be there, I can not be there. I can be around the football players, but also I can, I can take the dog for a walk. I can go out and walk with, with, with the um, members of my family and think clearly. Get outside of that environment a little bit more, and it's uh, it's certainly worked for me. So there are opportunities, huge opportunities there to really focus on what is important, what really does matter. Because when all this goes back to so-called normal, will we slip back straight into the mad rush of everything again, or will we? I found a, a different way of dealing with things. Yeah, yeah. Um, I really like this question. Um, it's, it's clearly come from a student. Um, and Alia says, how can we take a leadership position when we do not have the title of a leader? So I think what Alia is, is talking about <laughs> is when, 
when you're say for example in a group assignment so at uni and, and you're in a group and nobody is appointed leader but 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 you know she's basically saying how can you how can you take that leadership position my, it, my yeah. first thought on that is do you do you need the title does the title <laughs> make you feel better to be a leader you know i think that's that's important for me i think when you're in a group setting usually there is one person out of a group that will answer the question or answer what the lecturer has asked on behalf of the group does that make you a leader I think it, I don't think so. I think that just makes you part of the team. But some people do like, you know, in all walks of life, we do like titles. We do like, we do like, and there are some weird and wonderful titles that people get these days in the workplace. Um, I don't really see it as being a problem to me. I will do what I do regardless of whether I'm assistant manager or or I'm a leader of a department, I will, I will just try and contribute as much as I can. So for me, if you like being called a leader, fine. There is responsibilities in that. But I think it's better to sort of take a, a little look at being part of a group first, be part of a group of, and communicate well and grow together. And then your skills will come out in the end. Your skills will show itself as to whether you yeah. can take on that responsibility or not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, David, in your experience working in academia and within universities and leading groups of students, how, uh, what would you say to Alia? Uh, I think what Mike said is very important uh, and, and titles aren't important. Uh, and I absolutely echo what Mike says and he, he will, Mike's had experienced this because I've actually worked for Mike and worked for Mike several times and quite often I'll say I'm not I don't need a title I don't need a business card just tell me what the job is just tell me what needs doing uh, and I'll do it and by doing that you're sort of leading yourself now in the student world we have a structure which has lectures and seminars and this is so for a purpose and it's to facilitate both particular types of learning uh, and self-discovery and understanding of a topic. Now the lecture primarily is led by an expert who will impart the knowledge that they know and the knowledge that other academics know and guide you towards reading and perhaps getting an interest in that topic. What the seminar is really is for you to dive into that and to to not only read wider, but discuss and open it up. Uh, you know, everything, we can sort of lift the drains up and see what's inside and why it's inside and question things. And, you know, people forget we are allowed to ask questions. We are allowed to criticize things. Sometimes criticize is perhaps seen as a naughty word or a nasty word or a bad word, but it's a word that tests. It's a word that tests, does that work? Can it, could it work better? Is there another way of doing this? Sometimes the answer is no. That doesn't matter. That confirms that what's there in front of you is the best way to do it. But you feel better about it because you criticised it. Yeah. So my advice is to get involved, in particular in these seminars. I'm looking at a screen now. We have 21 questions in. So 21 people have led themselves they're asking a question and they're yeah. opening things up and mm -hmm. we're answering as many as we can, of course, but all these people, I would hope, will get answers or an idea to be able to get better or they'll certainly get some information that's a catalyst for them to actually find out more. So 21 people, none of those have said, I am the leader when they've come in with that question, but they're all taking the initiative and leading what they're doing today to take themselves forward. Yeah. So don't fear the title and don't fear the word, I think is my advice. That's brilliant, David. I think we've, we've got a question from Prabhu um, um, and he's from the University of Southampton. And Prabhu's asking, how do you handle a conflict in decision-making? I suppose as a leader, how, how do you handle that when you have a difference of opinion? Um, I think... But I, can I, I just, yeah, sure, Mike. Yeah. I, I think when there is a problem 
or what is seemed to be a problem, I think you try and find out as much as much information as you possibly can as to how that problem has occurred or how where is it originated from. You know, is it is it is it a, a problem to a single person or is it a problem to a lot of people within your within your uh, your group? Because yeah. sometimes it's just an opinion that somebody has that they want solving, and sometimes it can be a serious problem. You know that that is affecting the whole the whole environment that that you're working in. When it comes to that, I, I try and sit with the the people that that can give me an understanding of the issue or understanding of the problem. And then I try to break that down into what really is the root of that problem, because there is usually something defined in that, that problem, which needs addressing. And you've got to get to the root of that, that one single thing that is making this potentially spiral out of all control. If you get to the root of that problem, then I think it can be answered and answered well enough to satisfy a the person that's brought it to you, but satisfy the whole group of people that might have coerced that person to bring that problem to your attention. Yeah. You know, so so there's a there is a skill in that. There definitely is a skill in that. But I think out of it all, you try to like we've talked before. You try to earn the respect for the question for the problem, but also then deal with it respectfully. You know, and it may not be that you give the answer that they're looking for, but if you explain it well enough and with enough detail that it leaves it open, it leaves it still leaves it open, but it can be dealt with mm. and you leave it with that person to deal with it. Yeah. You know, because yeah. you are directing really, you are directing the way that this has to progress, this has to happen, you know, and, yeah. uh, and then it's you hand that over and let them get on with it and find yeah. a way through it. Yeah, I mean, throughout our conversation today, our discussion today, I've picked up on, on a few words that both of you have said, um, you know, re self-reflection is an important thing, um, putting people, people at the heart of, of what we do, um, respect, as you've just said, um, Mike. Now, Anis is asking a, a, a good question. You know, we make mistakes. Does admitting to the mistakes we did as leaders make us less authoritative to the team we're leading? What's your opinion on that? Shall we start with, with, with you, David? Uh, yes, we can. And no, it, it doesn't diminish your authority. Uh, we go back to the crux and the four key topics of the Ed Leeds Summit. And one of those is decision making. You've got to make decisions. Some things will be wrong and some will be right. Uh, failure or a wrong decision is A, the catalyst to learning and development, or B, something that will allow you to move on to the next step. If there are repeated decisions that are incorrect, then you may seek further help. Uh, you may get a call leader, you may get a collaborator, you may get in the football world, you've got an assistant manager, a senior coach, that type of thing. So what we also must remember here that leaders aren't on a pedestal and alone out there. They're not a completely isolated entity, for want of a better mm -hmm. word. Uh, that There is, even though they're leading a group, there might be a group next to them leading the group. And that is how we exist as a race. We are here to live in harmony and here to share the planet and share collective, share goals. Um, so self-reflect, I've some of the greatest things that I've perhaps done or achieved actually started with getting it completely wrong. And I, I gave that example last week with my first academic assignment. I, I went from a 40% borderline failure student mm. to a first class degree, master's, PhD and published scientist. That mm. started with the worst assignment you have probably ever seen. I got it completely wrong but yeah. I was open enough to ask why. Yeah, yes. Decision-making is, decision -making is the ultimate in a way. You know, it's, it's, it's getting to that point where you've done all your homework, you've done all the thinking, you've done all the talking, you've communicated it really well to everybody, but through the leader, usually 
the decision comes from. And that is the hardest line to cross because when you make the decision, be it right or wrong, there are consequences to your decision. Yeah. You know, and I think sometimes we forget the bigger picture is not just saying yes or no, it's about what would that, what does that look like? What does, what does it look like when I say, yes, let's do it, let's go for it? Or what does it do to somebody when they presented really well and students will do this, they'll present, they'll have worked hard, they'll have put so many hours into to a presentation. Then at the end of it, it gets critical, it gets picked apart, it gets opened up to the floor. And everything you've done, every all that energy you've put in is suddenly out there for everybody to question. And the feedback you get is not exactly what you're expecting. How would you handle that? That's a consequence of making a decision. Mm. But it's it's good. It's good in a way that if you are open-minded enough to be able to understand why you've made the decision, is it calculated? Is it is it spontaneous? It's also good to know what the consequences of those actions are going to be further down the line or within the group, because some will be satisfied, some won't be. But what you do, and hopefully you do, is try and make a decision out of, you know, try to be harmonising, try to harmonise, you know, everybody. You're not going to please everybody. That's a fact. You will not please everybody. Um, sometimes in leadership, you have to please yourself. There is that moment when you have to please yourself. But I think overall, the consequences of a decision are more important than sometimes the decision. Yeah. You know, if that's understandable. Because I've made decisions in my time, and I can give one example of this with Sir Alex, that there was one time we were planning for a pre-season tour. Mm. And believe you me at Manchester United that takes eight months nine months it's it's huge and yeah. we were we were going from traveling the world to suddenly trying to focus it onto a certain area and I remember Sir Alex ringing me at three o'clock English time in the morning shouting down the phone at me that I'd arranged something on the itinerary that he didn't know about mm. As it turned out, he'd forgotten about it he'd, he'd actually it had, it had slipped his mind. But at three o'clock, I'm taking a call from him where he's going, who told you you could make that decision? I didn't know about that decision. And where has that come from? You're changing some travel time from one place to another, but the travel difference was something like four hours and what have you. This doesn't fit to my schedule, he was saying. You know, the usual <laughs> things that a leader can do sometimes. But yeah. in the cold light of day, I was half asleep and I'm thinking, wow, do I really need this call right now? And should I put the phone mm. down and pretend pretend it was <laughs> somebody else? But in the end, I calmed him down by saying, I thought you gave me that element of decision making, that power at that moment in time to make those decisions. You did say that to me. And I did point that out to you, whether you forgot or not, but I made it. And in discussion with the other staff at the time, like the medical team and the sports science team, we all came to that agreement. It was just me that had to pass that decision on. And in the, you know, within moments of me saying that, I'd explained myself. He went, okay, fine, thank you. Put the phone down, went back to sleep. And that's, how these things, that's how these things happen, you know. Yeah. But it was... You know the art of decision making and the consequences of, of the action and he, he understood it he understood it but that shows you took ownership i took ownership yeah and i didn't i didn't go back to bed i didn't fall fast asleep after that because my mind was racing as to, i'm going over in my mind did that really happen now, i'm trying to recall all, all those meetings yeah. and everything to make sure i got it right because i knew at the other end he probably would do the same as well yeah but it was yeah. fine everything was great and the tour worked really well. And the decision really? was the correct one. <laughs> yeah. I cannot believe we have just 
we, we, we're almost reaching the end of our session. It's just flown by. Um, so I just want to, I just want to thank everyone who have asked questions. I'm sorry we couldn't answer everything, um, but I'm sure we will try and answer you offline, um, some of your questions. But just to wrap up, because I'm, I'm so conscious of the time, um, I just want to, to kind of ask Mike, do you have some words of wisdom for our audience today, Mike, um, and for this webinar series? Because this is the last one that we're on uh, that's from Sensible Soccer. So, so some words. Thank you for having me, you know, and thank you for having Sensible Soccer to, to do for these, these seminars. They've been as fascinating to me and as indulging to me as I hope it's been received by Edu City. Um, for me, I would like to just say what I find important is to be yourself. Really find your true self because that should not change. Don't be somebody you are not. You know, be yourself. And if you can, be unique. Be unique, you know, and, and, and really, really work at what you believe in, what your vision is. Find a way through this you know, life is not a straight road. It doesn't go from one end to the other. There's a lot of curves and a lot of bends on that on that pathway through. And there's some ups and some downs. Uh, but I think if you believe in what you're doing and you find yourself and you lead yourself, then I think you can achieve. And it may be the ultimate achievement. It may fit somewhere in the middle of what you really want to do. But ultimately, through education and certainly being a student, you will find a position, you will find a way. A degree is huge and it will be probably more important going forward. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean you know everything. I don't. Yeah. I don't. You know, yeah. sometimes people tell me that I do, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so make sure that now make sure you're available to everybody, make sure you're aware of who you're with, who you're working with, be yourself and find the motivation to excel Thank and it's you. been a pleasure it really really has and you know if there's one thing mm. i uh, i look forward to and, and i know you have a word uh, a, a sentence for that is jumper laggy is it jumper yes. laggy yes see you again i'm sure we yep. will and hopefully at some point i'll get out to the university and uh, and really really get involved in in student life Thank you, Mike. David? Uh, for me, go and explore. I, I think it, get yourself out there. Don't fear the consequences. Just go and explore. You're going to accumulate experience. Uh, I must say I've done some things that I didn't want to do, done some things I didn't like, done some things that I didn't think I would like, but really enjoyed them. Uh, but found that exploring and immersing yourself in things ultimately creates a greater bank of experience that gives you a greater set of tools to draw on as you go forward. Lots of what I do now and lots of these sessions and the questions, probably simply able to answer them because I've explored it in the past and be that 10, 20 or 30 years and being able to garner and gain good and bad experience so don't procrastinate especially at the young ages that these people are out there the majority on the webinar throw yourself at it experience is fantastic and yeah. again thank you it echo mike's words that it's been absolutely fantastic and um, this is a test for us as well we people sometimes look and think we've got all the answers and i agree with what mike says there we haven't and the students, uh, lecturers, participants, stimulate us. Are we better because of these four sessions? I would say, yes, we are. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, David. And thank you, everyone. It's been a real pleasure uh, to spend this time with you and, and also to bring um, Mike and David to you. Uh, for them to be able to share their experience. So um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, see you again. Over to you, Yasmin. 
Thank you very much. And as uh, this is the last series with Sensible Soccer, but not the last, but at least with some more coming up, I would like to say thank you very much from the EDCT team. Thank you, uh, Mike, David, Cecilia, for waking up super early to be with us <laughs> and share a series of invaluable experience because, you know, we are having participants as far as Germany, Peru, Oman, Egypt, India, Philippines, Brunei, Indonesia, Singapore, of course, wow. UK, Malaysia. <laughs> so um, I would like to also uh, say thank you because I think one of the most important um, traits of being a leader, as just you say, Sir Mike, is humility. And we have seen that from you, from all the past series. David, thank you very much. Thank you, Cecilia. Maybe we can have a final way to all our participants. Bye, everyone. Take care. Well done, staff. Well done, everybody who's made it possible. Terrific. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Awesome, thank you. Good luck, students. All right. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, that was it. It was the final series for Sensible Soccer featuring Mike Phelan, um, David Horrocks, and thank you very much, Cecilia. Um, to all the participants, I would like to um, do my closing now. Um, a very big thank you to Ministry of Higher Education and all of our partners. Of course, we have Lenovo Press, two of the series that's coming up uh, next week, Twinbeat, Gigex Global, Maybank, TikTok, and of course, our international partner, Sensible Soccer and GBA. So for registered participants, this is just hot from the oven. Can you see that? All right, so this is a, let me just get that straight. This is a signed home jersey. Sorry, let me back that up. I back that up. Let me find a good spot. So basically, that's a signed Manchester United home shirt jersey signed by all the current players and um, some of the other sensible soccer merchandise that you can win. How do you win it? Let me just share it with you. So the first 100 registered participants who completed all 10 series will definitely get your hands on some of the Sensible Soccer merchandise. But if you watch all 10 and be very engaging during the Q&A session, you will stand a chance. And of course, as I said, our grand prize is the sign and your home jersey. So follow our social media and turn on the notification for the winner announcement. And then uh, follow our social media handles, of course, Educity Official for Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. You can also follow us on LinkedIn at Educity Skandar Malaysia's Grammar Hut. Check out our YouTube page at Educity Official. Participants, you will also receive an e-certificate. Sorry, let me say that again. You will receive an e-certificate upon completing the survey. And for those who completed all 10 series, you will receive a platinum certificate. So look out for the survey page by the end of this session or turn on your notification for email from events at edicity.com.my. So the next series is going to be a session featuring Lenovo. We are very excited because there's going to be a video that talks about it afterwards. And then get the complete program schedule on adlitz.edicity.com.my. And for any inquiries, drop us an email at events at edicity.com.my. Check out this video that we've got an insight on the next series. I'm Yasmin signing off. Thank you very much.